Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. God bless you. Good to be together in the Lord's house. Thank you so much, worship team. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to come over with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and while you're headed there, just a couple of things for you. I want to remind you, uh, tomorrow, of course, is Memorial Day, and the church office will be closed tomorrow. Our regular Monday evening classes will not be meeting, and I uh, just want to encourage everybody to reflect on the meaning of that day and uh, give thanks that there were those who were willing to sacrifice their lives for our freedoms. You know, it's a good day not only to look back, but to, to look ahead and ask the Lord to um, be merciful and guard our freedoms. Please be sure to keep phase two in your prayers. We're really excited to see the progress that's taking place day by day. Continue to ask the Lord for good weather, no more monsoons, and uh, we need the Lord's supernatural provision as we move ahead. Don't forget also that our missions team is heading out to Nepal in about a month and a half, and uh, right now we're cl <coughs> excuse me, collecting different kinds of items for the ministry that we're going to be doing to children there. Uh, we're also collecting for the medical clinic that we're going to be operating. So uh, there's a flyer in your program today, and you can check that out for more information on how you can bless the people of Nepal, and please keep the team in your prayers. All right, Romans chapter 1, and uh, if you've missed any services lately, then I just really want to recommend to you strongly that you listen to Pastor Glenn's messages from Romans so far. We've really just started the book, but Pastor's been sharing some really wonderful insights about the righteousness of God and the good news of the gospel. And uh, as we move today through the end of chapter 1 and touch into chapter 2, we just need to circle back a little bit. We need to have the bigger picture of Romans 1 within our minds so we can see how God has graciously made a way of escape for us. Let's pray together, and then I'm going to read from the scriptures. And uh, the title of my message, message this morning is Hand It Over. Hand It Over. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning in the beautiful name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for this day and for gathering us together as the people of God. Father, especially in this weekend, Lord, we give you thanks for the liberties that we possess as a nation. Father, we thank you for those who were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, so that we could be a free people. And Father, especially at, at this season, we ask, Lord, that you would bring the comfort of the Holy Spirit to those families that have been bereaved because of war, Lord, over the past year. And Father, that you would look upon our nation and in your mercy, Father, would you continue to secure our liberty and our prosperity, Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. Jesus, you said that the word of God is like seed thrown upon soil. And so we ask you, Lord, that our hearts would be good soil across these next few minutes. Lord, soil that can receive and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us are spirit and they are life. So Father, would you send your spirit now to minister life to us out of the scriptures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I'm going to begin reading at verse 15 of Romans 1, and as I do, I'm going to pause here and there just to review. We were not in Romans last week. We had a wonderful guest speaker, and you should take advantage of that uh, CD or download as well. And uh, as I go through these, pass uh, these verses, we'll just review a little bit of what we've been exploring about the gospel and the righteousness of God. <clears throat> Romans 1, beginning in verse 15, Paul says... As much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel? He explains, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And why is the gospel the power of God that saves people? Paul says in verse 17, for in it, meaning in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is his righteous and perfect character. It's also the righteous deed that God performed in order to bring people eternal life through Jesus Christ. And the gospel, the good news, is the message that tells people just what he's done to save us. The gospel is you and I telling people how Jesus opened the door for people to be adopted by a loving Heavenly Father, as we heard about last week. 
And why do we have such a desperate need for this message? Paul tells us in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Scripture teaches us that God has wrath against sin. God's wrath is not a bad mood. It's not some kind of irritability. It's not the kind of emotion-driven anger that you and I know about. But it's the just response of a holy God to evil. And when the Father releases his wrath against sin, he is always perfectly fair and rational and appropriate. Paul says that God's wrath is being revealed or displayed. This means that you and I can already see it operating and having its effect on the human race. God is releasing his wrath against two types of evil. There is an evil that we commit against God, which Paul calls ungodliness. And second, there are sins that we commit against others that we commit one against the other, which he calls unrighteousness. And why do we need the gospel so desperately? It's because God's wrath is being released into people's lives, not only in eternity, but also in the here and now. And this is why we need the good news. Paul also explains why God is justified in releasing his wrath against the wicked. Verse 19 says, it's because what may be known about God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes have been clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Man moved away from serving God. We failed to glorify him. That means we failed to worship him as he deserves. And then adding insult to injury, we ceased to be thankful to him. The result, Paul says, was that our inner man became degraded. He goes on in verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. The fruit of that false wisdom was turning away from God and turning towards idolatry. Man's God-given creativity had become demonic cleverness. And Paul says that in the process of time, mankind ended up degrading himself by offering worship to idols of every different kind of creature. That's about as far as we've come in Romans thus far. And I'm going to just read on through now, beginning at verse 24. Paul says, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. Aren't you glad you're not me this morning? It's quite a list, isn't it? They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, 
undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, which means without having the natural affection that a human being should have, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Amen. These are incredibly profound words, and they are words that are much in the minds of people today. It is easy for us to read this passage and immediately get lost in the social and political controversies of the year 2016. And that would be a mistake. I don't mean to suggest that Paul has nothing to say that can help our society because he says things here that need to be said and need to be heard. However, we can't properly understand the parts of Romans 1 that people consider controversial unless we understand what comes before and after. Today, I want to share with you from Romans 1 and 2 three great deeds that God has performed in order to reveal his perfect goodness, his righteousness. Three great deeds that show us that God is a good and righteous creator. And the first one is this. God has handed mankind over to sin and to its consequences. God has handed mankind over to sin and to its consequences. God has handed over the Gentile world and indeed all of mankind to its sin. He is allowing us to reap the consequences of our rejection of God and of his ways. This reveals his righteousness expressed in his justice and in his wrath. Paul says in verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness. What does it mean to say that God gave them up? This expression is one that Paul uses repeatedly in this passage, and so we need to understand it. The Greek word is paradidomi. Would you say that with me? Paradidomi. And it means to hand something over. Now, this can be symbolic. For example, handing over or surrendering a city to an invader. But it can also be quite literal. For example, almost every time that the Gospels tell us that Jesus was betrayed, the Gospel writers use this word, paradidomi. And Paul tells us that because of idolatry, God handed mankind over to uncleanness. This is the wrath of God in operation as he begins to withdraw the restraint of his Holy Spirit from people. He stops opposing their descent into sin as he once did. We see the Lord's holiness in this way all the way back in Genesis when God said, My spirit will not contend with man forever. Church, aren't you glad that God is slow to anger? God is slow to anger, but his patience with man is not inexhaustible. And at some point, if we continue to push aside his love and his warnings, he will simply allow us to pursue what it is that we are longing for in the place of him. This is a frightful judgment that he would hand us over to our own sin. As Pastor Glenn shared a couple of weeks ago, seeing these things happening in our society doesn't mean that judgment is coming. It means that judgment is already here. Paul says the first stage of this process was to give them over to uncleanness. This word uncleanness simply means impure living. In fact, this word is the exact opposite 
of the word that Jesus used in the Beatitudes when he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This word is the precise opposite of that word. In other words, God in his wrath allowed people to become impure in heart. This refers to different kinds of moral corruption. Paul says they dishonored their own bodies and they dishonored each other. Uncleanness here can mean sexual impurity, but it doesn't have to. And this is God's wrath revealed at work against the world because of its idolatry. <clears throat> Next, Paul says in verse 26 that because of idolatry, God also gave them over to what he calls vile passions. Now that word vile is a Greek word that is translated in different ways in English. Your version may render it as shameful or dishonorable or degrading. And as we saw in the text, there is no doubt here that Paul was speaking specifically of homosexuality. Bible scholars believe that Paul mentioned women first because it was more shocking in his day to think of women engaging in those things. In any case, he describes homosexual activity by either sex as the result of a shameful lust. Now we need to linger here for a moment out of necessity and ask how we who live in the year 2016 should consider these words. Were these words of Paul that were just for his own day or perhaps for people just of his own background? Should we ignore this passage as being outdated and as unnecessarily offensive? Not at all. Church, the word of God is not limited to a certain time or to a certain culture. Many people, even some who profess to be a part of Christ's church, have criticized these words in recent years. But these are not the words of men. They are the words of the Holy Spirit. Paul's statements here are a part of sacred scripture and they remain binding upon the people of God. In this day of sexual revolution, may the Lord help us to remember how he said, the scripture cannot be broken. These words remain relevant in every place and in every century. They retain their power and their purpose, which is to teach us about the will of God and his plan for the human race. You know, despite the claims of some... Paul was not afraid of homosexuality, neither was he ignorant about it. In fact, in the first century AD, homosexuality was far more common than it is today. Actually, we can say without any hesitation whatsoever that homosexual, homosexuality was commonplace in the Gentile world and it was everywhere. Did you know that 14 out of the first 15 Roman emperors were all homosexual? I have to wonder how American Christians might react if our next 15 presidents in a row were all homosexual. I will spare you the specifics, but let it suffice to say that homosexuality was a major feature of both Greek and Roman civilization, and everybody knew it. The homosexual rights movement has tried to convince us that such passages ought to be ignored by believers. They seek to create distinctions or exceptions in the text that Paul never makes and that no Jewish or Christian writer of scripture ever imagined. Contrary to what some are saying today, Paul's purpose is not merely to condemn homosexual relationships in which one of the parties is being taken advantage of. Neither does Paul say that God approves of homosexuality when the parties are in a committed relationship. Instead, Paul points us to the order of creation, to what the creator has done and how the creator has organized what he has made. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus said, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, 
a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. By, that, by the way, that will give you a little help the next time somebody, whether well-meaning or not, tells you that Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Only a man and a woman can make the one flesh bond that God designed for the human race, and that's what Jesus said. Paul ties the appearance of homosexuality in society to idolatry. It is a symptom of mankind defying his maker and pushing the creator away. Actually, Romans 1 reveals a progression, a downward spiral in which little by little, God is stepping back, stepping out of our way and handing us over, letting us have our own desires. As we read this passage, perhaps you were able to pick out that sad progression. Paul says the human race has gone from honoring God to dishonoring God to dishonoring ourselves. And then we went beyond that to the point where he says that we actually have a passion for what is dishonorable. And in reality, these are only more attempts on the part of mankind to take away from the creator his right to say how his creation should work, how it should operate. One other thing that I want to say before we move away from these verses, and it's that Paul never says that homosexuality is the worst of all sins or that it is a sin from which people cannot be saved. I believe it was common for Paul to see homosexuals come to a vibrant faith in Christ and be transformed by his love and power. We saw this in the letters that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth where sexual sin of all kinds was rampant. Paul told the Corinthians, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says, such were some of you. If you're here today and you're struggling with same-sex attraction or struggling with your identity, I want you to know that you can be transformed. And it is not the kind of transformation that society wants to offer you. You may be a homosexual or you may be something else that is named on that list of sins, but we all need Jesus. Some people don't want to change, but other people have longed to change. And they've been changed, and we've seen it here in this church and in other places. Anyone who finds himself on that list can be transformed and can be put into right standing with God. That's the love that God has for you, and that's the power of the gospel. Let's move on now. We've seen that because of idolatry, God handed the nations over to uncleanness and to vile passions. Now in verse 28, Paul says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them over, he handed them over to a debased mind. Paul says the body and the passions have been degraded, and now he says the mind has been debased as well. Or your Bible may use the more old-fashioned language that some of you will remember that talks about a reprobate mind. What is a reprobate or a debased mind? In the Greek, this word means that something has been evaluated for quality and found lacking. Anybody ever watch the Antiques Roadshow? right? People come in with this, you know, little box of wires or, or dirt or whatever, and they think it's going to be worth $100,000, and it's worth a buck eighty-five, right? <laughs> and this word that Paul is using means exactly the same thing. Something has been tested and examined, and it's come up short. It's become disqualified and disapproved. There's another illustration that Paul actually might have had in mind, because the Old Testament talks about it. 
In the ancient world, this word described money that had gone bad. Now, this is not a problem we have today, although I know some of you do think the dollar is going south quickly. But remember, in the ancient world, the common people's money was often silver. And there was such a thing as reprobate silver. It was silver that had gone bad and become tarnished. And eventually, if it wasn't dealt with, a small silver coin that had deteriorated could become worthless, and a merchant would no longer take it. What a picture this is for us. Something that was once precious, beautiful, and useful could eventually become so ruined if care were not taken that it would no longer be useful at all. It was reprobate or worthless silver. And you know, in just the same way, the Holy Spirit, what's he telling us here? That our minds can become tarnished in this way and ruined for good and wholesome things. Paul makes a very obvious pun here in the Greek language. What he says in Greek is that because people thought it was worthless to know God, he let them have a worthless mind. What's the fruit of a worthless mind? A ruined mind reaps a terrible harvest that Paul sets forth in that awful catalog of 20-something sins, some of which we see spreading like a fire in our own society. And Paul says these are sins, these are things that are not fitting, meaning that they are shocking and that even the Gentiles ought to admit that they are improper and destructive. In that frightful list, Paul says such peoples are inventors of evil things, undiscerning, untrustworthy, and unloving. That means that they lack natural affection, something that we see so much of in our day when normal human empathy seems to be disappearing, when we see people commit cruel acts against children, against elderly people, and so on. We are shocked, and we say, like Paul, that such people are heartless. The Greek means that they are merciless. Church, this is not the anti-gay chapter in the Bible. This is the chapter that says, this is what we've become, and this is where we're headed if we don't return to God. What an indictment of human nature. In his righteousness, expressed in his wrath and justice, God has handed us over to uncleanness, to degrading passions, and given us a mind that invents evil instead of seeking God. Okay, everybody take a deep breath now. You made it through those verses. Are you ready for some good news? I know I am. Thank God, how many of you know, in Christ Jesus, there's always plenty of good news for those who really want it. Amen? Amen. The first deed that God performed to show that he's a righteous creator was this. He handed us over to sin and to its consequences. The second great deed that God has done to show us his righteousness is this. God has handed over his son to take away sin. God has handed over his son to take away sin. Back in verse 15, where we started our reading, Paul said, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to save everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And the good news is that although God has had to hand us over to our sin, as he is justified in doing, he has also done something about our plight. He handed over his son to take away our sin. When he handed us over to sin, it was a righteous expression of his wrath and justice. But when he handed over his own son to death, it was a righteous expression of his love and his mercy. The gospel tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ has satisfied all the wrath of God against sin so that anyone who trusts in that blood can go free. We spoke about that Greek word, paradidomi, and we said that it means to hand something over. For example, when Jesus was betrayed. But you know, there's more to it than that. The Bible certainly does say that Judas handed him over. It says that he was handed over to Pontius Pilate. 
But you know, there was another hidden drama that nobody knew about that was taking place behind the scenes, behind that drama. More than Judas, more than any other man, the father was the one who was handing over the son. Later on in Romans, Paul will blow his mind. He will ask the question, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but say this with me, delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, with Christ, also freely give us all things? And I know it won't surprise you now to hear that Paul was using that exact word, saying that he handed him over for us all. It's as if God were saying, because I'm holy and righteous, I had to hand you over to the consequences of your sin. But because I love you so much, here's my son. I'm handing him over so you can go free. What other God has done this? What a father we have. His holiness required him to let me go my own way. But his love compelled him to do whatever he could in order to bring me home, even at such a cost to himself. The well-known author and Bible college president, Pastor Erwin Lutzer, said it like this. We are more evil than we could have ever feared, but we are more loved than we ever could have imagined. Christ himself, the king of glory, came, and he also willingly handed himself over. Back in Galatians chapter 2, Paul said, you know, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the very same word, who loved me and handed himself over for me. This is the good news of our salvation. This was God's ultimate act of goodness, the ultimate demonstration to us of his noble character, the ultimate proof of his goodwill toward the human race, despite all of our wickedness and all of our pushing him away. You know that Jesus told a parable about Wicked men who refused to submit to his leadership. And those men said, we will not have this man to reign over us. But in spite of all of our rebellion, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. What amazing love. God showed the world his perfect righteous character by handing us over to sin He showed us his righteous character by handing over his son. And finally, God demonstrates his righteousness in this. Number three, God is now inviting us to hand our own lives over to him. He's inviting us to hand our own lives over to him. When he handed us over to sin, it was a demonstration of his righteousness in wrath and justice. When he handed over the son It demonstrated his righteousness expressed in love and mercy. But as he invites you and me today to hand ourselves into his fatherly embrace, he is showing the world his patience and his kindness. In verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2, Paul says, Do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? Worship team, you can come back, please, if you would. You know, over the centuries, people have debated over who it is that Paul is speaking to here. Who is the man? Who's the person who's judging people? Some people think that it's a rhetorical device, a common tactic of ancient writers. You know, they would sometimes make their case by writing in the form of a pretend argument that they were having with an imaginary opponent. Others think that Paul is speaking to the Jewish people because the Jewish people had always taken extreme offense at the idolatry and the homosexuality of the Gentile world. And so they might have said to Paul, hey, don't include us in that terrible list. But as we move it 
move in deeper into Romans, we're going to see that Paul is aiming his big guns at both the Jews and the Gentiles. And I think his remarks here are meant to include everybody, especially anyone who judges others hypocritically or who thinks that he somehow might be exempt from the judgments of God. This will ultimately lead Paul to say in the next chapter that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul wants us to realize that all of us can be found in that terrible catalog of sins. Whether you're a Jew or a Greek in the year 55 AD, or whether you're an American in 2016, you might not have done everything that the Greeks and Romans did on that list, but certainly each and every one of us can feel our own susceptibility to sin. Who among us has not been proud or envied someone else? Who among us has never withheld mercy or kindness from somebody when it was needed? Which of us has never sinned? Everybody has. And this is why the gospel needs to come to everyone so that it can save everyone. The Jew first, as well as the Greek, as well as the 21st century American. Paul said he was ready to preach the gospel. God's question to you and me today is whether we are ready to hear it and respond. Are we ready to stop running away from God's loving appeal to our hearts? Are we ready to hand ourselves over to him just as God was ready to hand over his son for love's sake? Let's not make the mistake that so many were making in Paul's day and so many are making in our day as well. Paul asks us in verse 4, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not realizing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? Do we look down our noses at what some would consider an outdated or unsophisticated belief? Friends, I hope not because the old-fashioned message of the gospel reveals to us the only God who loved you enough to hand over his own son for your sake. All of us have experienced his goodness, no matter who we are. Jesus said he makes his reign to fall on the just and on the unjust alike. And all of us have known his forbearance. When we commit a sin, and there doesn't seem to be any immediate consequences for it, that doesn't mean that God didn't see it. Paul says this is God's forbearance. The Father, out of sheer mercy, is simply refraining from rendering immediate punishment. And all of us have seen his long-suffering, his patience. You know, in Greek, this word is the opposite of the word short-tempered. Seems like long-tempered would be a useful word to have in English, but we don't have it. But this word is it. It's the opposite of short-tempered. Aren't you glad that God isn't short-tempered? Amen? But Paul exhorts us not to be foolish. We need to be wise and realize that God's failure to judge us up to this point has only been a pure act of kindness on his part. We should take advantage of that mercy, he says, and take our opportunity to turn to him today in repentance. That means a change of mind and a change of heart and a change of our direction and our course before it may become too late. Many of you will remember how Peter said the same thing, a well-known verse in 2 Peter 3. Peter says, God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Paul's telling us here, the Holy Spirit is telling us that God's merciful kindness is meant to soften our hearts and help us to realize that we can and we should and we must return to him in faith and in trust. Just as God handed over his son, so now in turn the greatest need that you and I have is to hand our own selves over to him in return. Three powerful things that God has done to show the world his perfect and righteous character. 
He handed mankind over to sin, showing his wrath and justice. He handed Christ over for sin, showing his love and mercy. And now he invites us to hand our lives over to him to free us from sin, showing us his goodness and his kindness. We stand together with me and let's give Jesus the Savior our praise this morning. Come on and give him a hand of praise.